thank you. Um, my toes are curling, which is an English expression for feeling slightly embarrassed and overwhelmed. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for getting up after the dinner to come and listen to me. I'm going to talk a little bit about work I have done that points out the importance of schools, both as an uh, opportunity where children go to support um, children's mental health, to identify and intervene with those who are struggling, and then talk about some interventions and some caveats, both universal to the whole population, thinking more about prevention, and um, then targeted or indicated on those children who are struggling. I'm going to start with some hopeful news. So what you are looking at here are bar graphs that relate to our three large national surveys. These were probability samples. The first two covered England, Wales, and Scotland. The last one, only England. And what you are seeing is a comparison across England. And our children are getting healthier. The number of children with a long-term physical health condition has dropped significantly. That really surprised me, but I checked it out with colleagues who are uh, pediatricians, and they said, oh, yeah, why are you surprised at that? Well, I'm surprised because the number of children with psychiatric disorders is increasing. So the age group that is common across um, these three surveys is a rather odd age group of 5 to 15, which is the age group in the first one. Um, and the difference was significant but small. It's not the kind of tsunami that you see in the press, but it is a significant deterioration. And that is not good. It's almost entirely explained by an increase in the number of children with anxiety and depression. And this is at disorder level. This was a single phase epidemiological study. Every child had a parent interview. If the young person was over 11 and they agreed, they, they were interviewed themselves in person. And if the family agreed, a shortened questionnaire was mailed to teachers. So it's multi-informant, standardized diagnostic assessment, assigning diagnostic criteria. We did both ICD-10 and DSM, and we report them separately. But these are children with a disorder that impairs them. The other thing that has been consistent across all these three surveys is the fact that whether we like it or not, or whether we plan it or not, school staff, so teachers, teaching assistants, are a frontline mental health service. It's where parents and children go, because it's where parents and children know practitioners, and they expect them to be able to help. Now, teachers have a very demanding job as it is. We shouldn't expect them to be therapists, but I don't think we can ignore this. Um, and you can see the drop-off in the older teenagers in red, because our compulsory education stops at age 18. It worries me slightly where those young people are going. There is a cost associated to this, and it's enormous. So my PhD examined where people went for help, talking to parents, so this is probably an underestimation of the costs on schools, because we're not hearing about meetings and discussions that don't involve the parent. So Martin Knapp, in the photograph, and his team at the London School of Economics put costs around this. And you can see that the cost to schools, frontline education services, absolutely dwarf the cost to the health service, and likewise for specialist mental health service. Now, I was talking to these parents. Most of that time and intervention was around meetings. It's not necessarily therapeutic. So that means we are spending a lot of time and expensive salaries tr dealing with mental health problems in the school setting, but not in a therapeutic way. We should pivot. We don't necessarily have to spend more money, although I do think services are underfunded. But we are spending a lot of money anyway, whether we like it or not. We might as well do it by deciding to do it. The other thing I want to point out is we were able to replicate the um, Isle of Wight study by putting together the children who had a disorder in the first two surveys, so 99 and 2004, because both of these were followed up with a full survey three years later. So I've put persistence in quotes because, of course, we have two snapshots. We don't quite know what's going on in between. 
But you will see half of those who met diagnostic criteria at baseline also met it three years later. And that's really bad news because we seem to have more children meeting diagnostic criteria, but also um, the Cardiff group led by Ruth Sellers for this particular work demonstrated that actually for children who struggle, their adolescent outcomes are worse in more recent cohorts. So she compared a 1970s birth cohort with the Ausback birth cohort, they were born about 1991, with the millennium cohort born at the turn of the century. Somebody else has demonstrated the same thing from adolescence to adulthood. It's Pravita Pathale, only two cohorts, so not quite as powerful, but all the nonetheless worrying. And then not yet published, but presented here yesterday, um, Jessica Armitage from Cardiff and Tamsin New Love Delgado from um, Exeter have demonstrated that parents and young people of children with disorder are reporting a higher level of difficulties and a higher level of impact in the most recent UK survey compared to the previous two. Interestingly, we don't see that in teachers and we don't see it in the children without a disorder and the latter suggests this is not just parents and teachers reporting more problems in general. Thinking about how we might intervene, the predictors of persistent disorder, and because we put these two big surveys together, we had enough power to examine this. The predictors of who had a persistent disorder are informative, and I think they're things we don't think about enough as clinicians and child psychiatry clinics. First of all, peer relationships. We need to be really thinking both on a universal level, but also with children in the clinic, what's going on with their peer relationships and um, pressure on parents. I don't think we're as good as we could be at supporting parents with the distress of parenting a child with poor mental health, but also um, plugging them into their own support. And in fact, in the 2004 survey, looking forwards to 2007, the three-year follow-up, we demonstrated a bi-directional relationship between parent and child mental health. I suspect, as clinicians, you would all accept that a family can probably only be as happy and functional as its unhappiest member. It has an impact on everyone, and we should do more to remember that. Now, I've talked a bit about the diagnostic assessment that was used in these big surveys. When COVID hit, we were due to do a follow-up. We obviously couldn't go out and interview families at home. I don't think we'd have got the funding for it either. But what we could do was a, a questionnaire measure mailed out digitally and um, in hard copy. And we used the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire. Now, that has an algorithm that will combine informant responses when you've got it. We didn't have teachers because schools were closed and it just would have been logistically too difficult, but we did have parents of those under 16 and the young person themselves if they were aged 11 or over. And this algorithm spits out a likelihood of probable disorder, possible or unlikely. So when I talk about probable disorder, that's what I mean. And interestingly, this probable disorder prediction wasn't higher, in fact, it was a little bit lower than the diagnostic assessments, though the Dauber suggested a prevalence of one in eight. By the SDQ algorithm, it was one in nine. Close, but not, not the same. What we have found in our COVID follow-ups is a jump from one in, one in nine to one in six that has been maintained. And then last year, we saw a worrying further jump up to one in four of our older teenagers. So that's a group we need to be particularly worried about, I think. And it won't surprise those of you who know your epidemiology that the prevalence of disorder is not the same across the population. And there are two groups I think we need to be really worried about. First of all, young boys. Um, and this has been, you know, has been niggling up over the last three surveys. And young women have consistently been doing badly since the 2017 survey, but it seems particularly acute at the moment. I should stress that we have a data gap in the under 10, so obviously the problem with following the same sample is the younger children grow up. They were two to begin with, but we're, we're losing information on that very young group. And actually, when 
Tamsin New Love Delgado did a systematic review of all you know, global studies, there's a data gap in the under 10s and we need to be aware of that because it might mean that they're ignored. COVID affected a lot of things. People have described it as a syndemic um, because it accentuated all kinds of inequalities. And this is just an example of one of them. We have listed on the left-hand side the things that we as a research team thought were necessary in order to be able to access education. And you will see that even amongst the children who were doing well, one and a half percent had no access to any of these things. So essentially, we're left without education, without peer contact, probably. We live in small families, mostly, in the, in the UK. And it won't surprise anybody that the grey bars sh show that for those with disorder, they had less access. Now, cross-sectional data, but it probably doesn't help. And we know that one of the main worries in other surveys has been keeping up with school and the impact of the school closures on their academic work and their prospects further on. Again, I don't apologize for repeating this, you will all know this, but there is a very, very strong association between socioeconomic deprivation and poor child mental health, also poor adult mental health, and it seems to put particular pressure on families. And although I come from, you know, stiff upper lip British, you know, you, shouldn't, you should be politically neutral as a doctor. I don't think we should be, actually. I don't think we are doing the children in our populations a service if we don't advocate for the fact that we need to alleviate child poverty, particularly, although we live in a very privileged society, most of us, we have rising cost of living and more and more families um, really struggling to eat, to heat their homes, to keep a home, shouldn't be happening. Another area which is really important to think about, it's not necessarily the realm of um, child psychiatrists and mental health practitioners, but we absolutely have an important role to play, and that's special educational needs. I couldn't believe how little data there was on this. Um, so you'll see this highly sophisticated analysis called a Venn diagram that you will have all done in primary school, of special educational needs, having a mental health condition, and having a long-term condition. And it shows the overlap. On the left-hand side, you have parent report, which could be the parent being worried, or it could be confirmed, and there could be local informal support in the school. On the right-hand side, to firm it up and, and make it a little bit stronger, but they will be a more severe group, is having what we call an education, health and care plan, and that means formally recognised and assessed special educational needs. Now, when we did a regression analysis that adjusted for all kinds of background factors like age, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, anything you can think of pretty much, having a Children with a DSM-5 disorder were six times more likely to either have parent-reported um, special educational needs or, indeed, an education, health and care plan. The odds ratio reduced a bit, but not a lot. And the relationship, I suspect, is complex. For some children with a neurodevelopmental disorder, their neurodevelopmental disorder may well be their special educational need, and that would have been included within the DSM disorders. For other children, they may have learning or social needs that place such pressure on them it precipitates a, a mental health condition or a psychiatric disorder. And then still others, you'll see there is an intersection where there are children with poor physical health, poor mental health, and special educational needs. If you have a condition like cancer or poorly controlled diabetes and you're in and out of hospital for long periods of time, that will impact your access of education, but it also places you at risk for mental health. This long preamble is, is saying that really we do need to pay attention to children's educational needs and support them in a timely and efficient way. When I first got interested in the interface between mental health and schools. I went back to our survey documents to see what else we'd asked, what else could I look at? And I found this question, which is really bad methodologically. I'll ask two things in the same question. It's also quite pejorative, but we thought we'd have a look at it anyway, because relationships are important. 
And I hope I can convince you that if a parent is answering a lot to whether or not their child is distressed because the child feels they've been unfairly picked on by a teacher, that there probably is something unhealthy about the teacher-pupil relationship. We were really shocked to find nearly one in 20 parents reported this across the sample. Now, this is a very busy slide. It deals with primary school aged children only, and I'll talk you through it. So, having found this surprise finding that one in 20 children seem to have a very problematic, at least one very problematic teacher-pupil relationship, we then look forward from 2004, where that was measured, to what happened to them in 2007. So that's your left-hand column. And we looked at four outcomes. Any psychiatric disorder, conduct disorder, because that's particularly difficult for schools to manage, poor family function, and exclusion from school, by which I mean being suspended or expelled. For primary school children, there weren't enough who had been excluded, mercifully, for us to study that. The figures are odds ratios with their 95% confidence intervals. If that sounds like, like I'm talking Chinese to you, where it's in blue and in italics, that's a statistically significant relationship. And the number at the top is roughly how many times more likely, adjusting for background factors, the child with a poor teacher-pupil relationship is to have the outcome. Now, I've shown you that if you have a disorder at baseline, you are Half of them are going to have a disorder at follow-up anyway, adjusting for various things. So we adjusted for baseline disorder or whatever outcome. But then we were so worried about the Daily Mail getting hold of this and ripping it to shreds and ripping us to shreds that we thought, well, the cleanest thing, there's always residual confounding. Let's take them out. And you'll see it's interesting for conduct disorder that actually makes the association stronger. The confidence intervals overlap, but the point estimate increases, which is not what we were expecting. We then thought, well, disorder isn't everything. And I'm, I'm going to show you a graph that illustrates that. So maybe we ought to adjust for the severity of the disorder using the teacher pupil using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. So that's your right-hand column. And when we do that in primary school, pretty much everything drops out. But if we're expecting to see a signal three years down the line, actually, that's probably over-adjusting. And somewhere between the two, the, these, these data were always gathered in the spring term because that's the easiest time in the UK for schools. And therefore, the child had been exposed to the teacher for some time, and it may have been having an effect. So I would argue that somewhere between the figures in the left, the, the, the two columns with numbers in, lies the truth, if you want it. And it's even more stark in secondary school. No effect on family function amongst secondary school pupils, but predicted to exclusion. So teacher-pupil relationships and supporting teachers to develop um, good teacher-pupil relationship seems to be a really important thing. <coughs> Excuse me. I got very interested in exclusion from school because these were children I was seeing in the clinic. The typical story was a child referred, usually 8, 9, 10, upper end of primary school, long history of problems, and almost all had a neurodevelopmental condition of some kind with behavior problems, laid on top of that. You're trying to get the diagnosis, get support in place, and the school excludes them because they've referred them at the moment where they're like, I can't cope with this. And I was thinking, if we could only have these children five or six years earlier, you can see them coming. If you look in the Ausback sample, the children excluded in primary school, um, I'm not going to show you a slide, but I've done the analysis, they come into school with sky-high SDQ scores. So um, we thought, in our naivety, we demonstrate this to people, and then we train SENCOs, special needs coordinators in schools, and you know, we provide information for teachers, we identify children early, and we solve the problem. So Claire Parker, in the photograph, this was her PhD. She used the 2004 data. There's a question on the impact scale of the SDQ, which basically says, do you think this child has a problem? And we separated the no minor difficulties from the yes, definite or severe to give us recognition by a teacher or a parent, sometimes both. So then you have four groups. You have the children without a disorder 
and nobody's worried about them. You have a subclinical group who, if you look at their SDQ scores, they're not doing well. They might not meet diagnostic criteria, but there is a problem, and the teachers and parents are worried. You then have children with a disorder, but the parents or teachers are not worried. That's our unrecognized group. And then the group where the disorder is recognized by a parent, teacher, or both. And we were completely wrong. The children with recognized disorder, and we demonstrated this in a sample we gathered prospectively as well, it's not a problem with recognition. It's a problem about not expecting services to respond, so not making the referral, and we really need to try and do better. We were also wrong, and I, you know, I guess I know this as an epidemiologist, it's the externalizing disorders and neurodevental developmental disorders that impact on other people more and are more likely to be recognized. It was the emotional disorders that were unrecognized. And, it, you know, that kind of made sense. It wasn't what I was seeing in the clinic, which is interesting, but made sense. So what are we to make of all of this? Well, um, in 2015, what was then Public Health England and the Children and Young People's Alliance came up with what I think is a really sensible framework about thinking about how we as mental health practitioners and other health practitioners, actually it's not just us, can work with schools to promote health um, in schools, starting with really strong management. Um, the management has got to buy into the importance of this because otherwise everything else, it's like winding up, you know, little bits of a, a mechanical toy and pushing them out into the world and they just wind down. You have to have the senior management team on board. The school climate is really important and I can show you empirical evidence to demonstrate that in a minute. There needs to be staff development and looking after staff well-being because if staff are burnt out and stressed, then that will be reflected in their interactions with students. The student should have a voice. There should be timely recognition of children who need help. And whether you're thinking at the whole school level, the universal interventions, or at targeted or intervention targeted interventions for vulnerable groups or indicated interventions for those who perhaps need referral and treatment by a specialist, you need to be monitoring what you're doing. So you don't have this, you know, seeing somebody at school, seeing a peer mentor at school for maybe three or four terms and nothing's changed, but you go and see them every week. If it's not working, then let's try something else. Timely identification of need and timely response. I'm sad to say that, you know, not far off a decade on, we're nowhere near in the UK, and if you think your country's got this button, please raise your hand. I'm not that optimistic to see a forest of hands going up, but it's something we can aspire to. So I mentioned earlier the subclinical group, um, that, you know, there is a fuzzy border between our disorders and the ordinary children. What you're looking at here is the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire from 2004. On the far left, you have, um, you have the self-report, then you have the parent report, and then you have the teacher report. And it's this difference in shape of the curves is very interesting to me because the only difference is she, he compared to you and between the parents and the teachers is a little P or a T in the top left-hand corner. It's exactly the same questionnaire. But you can see there isn't a distinction, really, between those who have disorder and those who don't, and there will be some bubbling under where what's actually making the difference is the family, school, and community that that child is in, the kind of social scaffolding that's around them. So my journey into what we might do about this started, gosh, probably about 15 years ago now, thinking, well, behavior problems then were the most common mental health condition. They were stressing out teachers. It's a really, you know, managing difficult behavior is one of the things that drives teachers out of the profession. And these children have appalling outcomes. Um, if you have conduct disorder, your outcomes across the board are really bad. Now, the nice recommended treatment is parent training, of which the incredible years um, is one option. 
um, NICE, for those who don't know, is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in, in the UK that writes guidelines. However, in the clinic, I was seeing families that were not back when things were better at home, but something went wrong in school, and the parents were often made to feel like it was their fault, and then the whole family gets into a coercive negative cycle again. When I'm feeling brave and I'm talking to teachers, I ask them, do you think you can get your pupils to make their beds and tidy their rooms? And so far, nobody's said that they can. But when we hold parents responsible for their child's behavior in the classroom, that's essentially what schools are doing. And obviously, family and parenting is hugely important, but actually, the parent is not there in the classroom, and no amount of parent training is going to fix a school-based problem. So I started thinking, well, you know, the parenting program's gone everywhere, and, the, and if you are going to do one thing to try and tackle behavior problems, absolutely, that makes sense. But maybe we should also, and I should say our teacher training in the UK doesn't pay much attention to classroom management. You learn on the job, so you learn by watching, um, and you fall back on your own experience, which may or may not be great. So maybe we should try, try to teach teachers or hone their skills at managing the classroom as a public health intervention. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Incredible Years Teacher Classroom Management, it focuses on operant conditioning. So you get the behavior that you pay attention teach to. Teachers are really important um, attachment figures, and therefore that gives you a tool. So if you respond most to the children who are doing what they should be doing, and you ignore as much of the low-level destruction as you can, obviously keeping everyone safe, you distract and redirect the children who are misbehaving rather than paying attention to the, the behavior you don't want and then respond to when they do what you do want. Um, but this is not just about letting children do what they want. There are clear expectations about what you want and the consequences for both good behavior and undesirable behavior. So I did a randomized control trial of this intervention as a public health intervention. 80 schools were randomized to either one teacher from one primary school class went through the intervention, the other 40 taught as normal. We got data before randomization, then went back to the um, schools before the end of the year to see how it had gone. But of course, you can't blind teachers to the fact that they've gone on a course. If you can find out a way to do that, tell me. Um, so we therefore followed, we insisted on single year groups, so the teacher and the child separated, and we followed them for another two years afterwards. I could talk for a whole hour on this trial, but I'll just give you a brief summary. We found a small, but statistically, and I think at a public health level, probably clinically significant difference in child mental health, but only at nine months. It washed out, as did improved peer relationships and better, more pro-social behavior. Now, that fits the model of change, so that was encouraging. What was more exciting to me as a clinician is that in a planned subgroup analysis, those scoring above the clinical cut point on the SDQ had a sustained improvement across the whole three years. Now, that's with teachers who probably didn't know whether or not their um, colleague had gone on the course because control teachers got the intervention a year later. Um, similarly, classroom behavior on a, a separate measure and concentration, the ADHD subscale of the SDQ, improved across the whole three years. There was a complicated interaction between mental health and academic progress. Our measure was scrappy and we couldn't get it on many kids, but it was enough to think something going on there. And it was probably cost effective depending on your willingness to pay. It's much less expensive than many drugs that are approved by NICE or other interventions. So this um, got me plugged in with the Education Endowment Foundation. Now, this is a foundation that funds research and really works hard to provide teachers and educational practitioners with evidence-based interventions in schools. They have an excellent website where they, will, they have researched loads of measures 
um, and likewise interventions. And we conducted with Darren Moore, who's a colleague in Exeter, you can see him in the photograph there, we conducted three linked systematic reviews that then distilled into a practitioner report that came down to the six principles on the um, slide in front of you, which I won't read out. But they're broadly, because there is more evidence, at the time I published my trial, there were another two trials that published around about the same time, and there'd been other smaller studies that had taken the IY teacher course and tweaked it a little bit. So it is the one with the most evidence. One of the things we encourage schools and teachers to do is to focus on the things that they can directly um, influence rather than get paralyzed and overwhelmed by the things that they can't. And it encouraged the Education Endowment Foundation to fund another trial. Now, it was bigger because I felt we didn't have enough power. I got as much money out of the National Institute of Health Research as I could, but it, you know, we could only train one teacher in a school. That's hopeless for changing a culture. Um, so they trained all the year one and year two teachers. So that's children who are aged between the ages of about five and seven. The children were going to be followed for two years because if you think about it, my, in my study, they were only really exposed to um, the intervention for half a term once the teacher had completed training. And actually, one of the things that teachers said in focus groups at the end of intervention was, oh, you know, this has been brilliant this year, but you wait till next year when I can use it in my planning. And it was like, oh, we're following the children. We're not following what happens to the teachers. So we, we followed them for longer. And then we were going to use the standardized assessments that all seven-year-olds sit, very unpopular um, tests as a better measure of um, educational attainment. And also we had a measure that we developed and validated of teacher-pupil relationships because our process evaluation suggested that that's, that's where the change was. And then COVID happened. So our children were not in the classrooms, many of our teachers were sick and left, and um, the year two SATs didn't happen. We, we were then going to go in and do tests, but the schools were like, no way, we're dealing with too much chaos, you have to respect that. And the response rate was about 50%. So no outcome measure for academic attainment on the SDQ for what it's worth, there wasn't a difference. The, the um, Education Endowment Foundation haven't even given an evidence level with this, they just feel that you know, we did what we did, we did better than some trials at the time, but we can't really conclude anything. However, a little hopeful anecdote, there were group leaders that delivered the intervention in my trial and this later trial who said, the teachers get this, they're coming in, you know, we're a little bit redundant, so we wonder if that practitioner review had kind of been taken up by training colleges and, you know, it's had its impact. I think we could do more, but that's a quiescent bit of research. I'm now going to talk a bit about the Myriad study as a salutary to stale. So we've done primary school. This is a universal intervention in um, secondary schools led by Willem Kuyken from Oxford. I was one of the collaborators. And the question we asked is, would a mindfulness-based um, curriculum, it was eight weeks, it was quite thorough, um, would it prevent the increase in depressive symptoms that we often see in the mid-teens? Would it protect mental health or would it improve well-being? We had three co-primary outcomes. And the answer was no, eight years later, <laughs> which is a bit deflating. However, we have this amazing data set that we can answer lots of other questions on. Um, and one of them was, OK, we say schools are a really good setting, and they are a really good setting to develop interventions. We need to be a bit careful not to overload teachers. We can't just leave schools and teachers to do it all, because they have a very busy, demanding, important job to do. Um, but how much of the variation in mental health relates to school-level factors? And the answer to that is really not very much. It's somewhere between 1% and 3.5%, whether you look cross-sectionally at baseline, um, where we had an enormous sample, or whether you look like the children who eventually made it into the trial, which was still 8,000, and this was 84 schools. In both the baseline data and in the 
longitudinal data, school climate, which is tractable, was one of the factors that predicted. In fact, in the longitudinal data, it was the only predictor. So paying attention to school climate, another indication that it's important. I think we shouldn't, you know, the mindfulness um, work is really interesting. Policy and implementation here was running way ahead of the evidence. And when I presented this, I usually get people coming up saying, well, my school does mindfulness and, you know, we find it great. Um, what I can say is for the age group that we work with, with that eight-week curriculum, we have no evidence of a protective effect. However, we train the teachers in the schools to deliver it, and that involved them going through their own eight-week training, some by a book. In the, in the trial, they all had individual, you know, going to a mindfulness-based stress reduction course because we wanted the gold standard. But we did a separate trial of a book and a short course, or the... Um, eight-week course and a four-day training. So that gave us four different options. And they all work, which is really interesting. They all have, and in fact, they all produce some teachers who are competent. So I guess it's about matching um, the way you train. Now, the teachers at, in this trial had le less burnout. And actually, in the trial, school climate improved. It might not be a reason to do an eight-week Development, but it might be a reason for training teachers. We shouldn't assume that because something is meant to protect, that it's harmless. So in this study, there were worse outcomes for the children who were depressed at baseline further, you know, further on at the end of the trial. And that mirrors Paul Stallard's um, earlier trial of a cognitive behavioral classroom-based intervention, which was given to everybody but aimed at the children who were vulnerable for depression. It didn't help them, but it actually seemed to make those who were depressed initially worse. And we can really, you know, there's lots of questions you can ask about that. Um, Judy Kidger has just popped up in the top left corner because this was another example of um, a, a negative trial. So she had literally just got funding from the NIHR for the Wellbeing in Secondary Education, the WISE trial, which was of mental health first aid, training teachers with the idea that they support each other and they support the school. We got the funding and Theresa May announced that every school was going to have someone trained in mental health first aid, which we thought, oh, that might be a bit difficult for our control group. Needless to say, it didn't get implemented, so we we were okay, but our trial was negative. So we need to be advising policymakers about glossy brochures. Now, don't try and read the detail of this slide. Very, very busy. It's just to show you that the Myriad trial had two cohorts. We couldn't get around 84 schools in it all in one go. So the first cohort got through before COVID, but the last cohort, there was... Um, the COVID impact and the lockdowns between our penultimate and final data collection, which allowed us to test whether or not being exposed to this mindfulness-based curriculum helped you cope with this extraordinary stressor. It didn't, sadly. But then it allowed us to, to answer, well, were, were there differences in how the cohorts did between time three and time four? And there were. So the the young people exposed to COVID did worse on every single measure. Thinking about interventions now, um, this is place to be as a counselling organisation. They do whole school as well, but what they're known for is individual counselling. This is not CBT or IBT, it's old-fashioned counselling. They are very outcome-driven, though. They, they gather, they've got 90% post-intervention outcome measures, which is pretty good. And you can see from the slide that there is a big job, and it's sustained at a year's follow-up, um, which suggests that it's effective, but no counterfactual. So Katie Finnings, in the picture, propensity score matched to the national survey, and actually there's quite powerful information that these children were still functioning better than you would expect two years down the line. Simple intervention with mild conditions on the whole can work. We've also looked at um, attendance. 
the percentage attendance, we're comparing percentage attendance in the term when the child was referred for counselling and then percentage attendance in the term after they finished. No difference. However, the Department of Health has a metric of 90% attendance and you're persistently absent if you drop below that. And that was improved. More interesting when you look at the outcome of the counselling. So for those where um, they st either stayed in the unlikely to have a disorder, you wonder what they're doing with counselling, um, or they improved the middle and the top line, they're showing improved attendance, whereas those who stayed in prob probable or deteriorated, they, um, they deteriorated. I am nearly finished, two more slides. So bringing this all together, it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, and I hope it hasn't felt like death by PowerPoint. We as clinicians, of course, are often thinking about the individual pupil. And that is our role. That's what we're set up as clinicians to do. However, we shouldn't forget that it doesn't have to be us, but we need to work together with all agencies working with children to think about what we can do at the classroom and the school level, and that obviously the socio-political becomes very important as well. And Claire Parker, when she was... Um, doing the qualitative bit of her PhD, came up with the wonderful idea of a coping continuum. And I think we're all on a coping continuum, aren't we? So in terms of exclusion from school, it was that these children had very long and complex journeys. And it's a single intervention is probably not going to do it. But you have the family and the school with the child in between and lots of other factors playing in, and they move between coping and not coping over time. But that gives us time to see them coming and to intervene either on, you know, on all those different levels. So some of the data I've given you is, I think, frankly, a bit depressing. But if one in six children of school age in the UK are struggling, that means five out of six are doing OK. We should remember that the vast majority of our children are doing OK, and we need to support them and equip them for that. What we want to do is try and re reduce the numbers in the vulnerable and in the clinical population. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.